Today we will be discussing ductal carcinoma in situ, also known as DCIS. So just to start with the case study, we have a 49-year-old woman coming in with screening detected microcalcifications in her right breast, categorized as BIRAD0. She essentially has no breast or nipple symptoms, uh, and her medical and surgical history, as well as her family history, are overall fairly unremarkable and listed below. So given those findings, she underwent diagnostic mammography, which demonstrated a region of coarse calcifications at the upper outer right breast, spanning a distance of 12 millimeters. Because of that, she underwent stereotactic biopsy, which showed DCIS, intermediate grade, ERPR positive with associated comedone necrosis. So what is DCIS? DCIS is essentially stage zero breast cancer. It's breast cancer that is still def uh, confined within the duct and has not invaded out of it. It's significant because roughly 10 to 20 percent of DCIS at the time of excision will come back as invasive cancer, as well as the fact that it puts you at risk for increased risk of breast, breast cancer in the ipsilateral breast. Its incidence has significantly increased. Part of this has to do with the fact that 90 percent of DCIS is found on screening mammography and screening mammography has increased. Uh, as of 2015, roughly 60,000 women in the U.S. per year were diagnosed with DCIS. Its risk factors mirror those of breast cancer. For example, age, increasing breast density, um, genetic syndromes, obesity, etc. It's typically graded on a low, intermediate, and high scale, or a 1 to 3 scale, uh, with a listing of associated features like necrosis, as well as its estrogen and progesterone receptor status. So how do we diagnose it? Typically, we perform diagnostic mammography. 90% of women with DCIS will have suspicious microcalcifications on mammography. Less common findings go to mass or other soft tissue change. Because of that, it's the gold standard. Some limitations include that it may underestimate the extent of disease and the number of foci. One thought to rectify that was to use MRI. A recent study by the British Journal of Surgery that looked at women with DCIS, roughly 10,400 of them, of whom 2,400 underwent breast MRI, showed no reduction in the risk of margin involvement. However, women were twice as likely to undergo mastectomy. Uh, typically, following diagnostic mammography, we perform a coronal biopsy. So again, we perform diagnostic mammography, and MRI is not routinely indicated, and following that, we get a tissue diagnosis. So treatment considerations, we talk about breast conserving therapy or lumpectomy versus mastectomy, sentinel lymph node biopsy, indications for adjuvant radiation and endocrine therapy. So breast conserving therapy, this can be a viable option if you're able to obtain a cosmetically acceptable, acceptable resection given the size of the disease versus the breast. You perform localization prior, whether it's through a wire, a savvy scout, a radio seed, etc. It's essential to obtain negative margins, which I'll discuss more, and it may require return to the operating room if margins are positive. The risk of recurrence is further modulated based on the usage of adjuvant radiation and endocrine therapy. You can also consider oncoplastic breast surgery, so if something like a breast reduction uh, when you remove the DCIS, as well as a reduction in the contralateral side for cosmesis. In regard to margins, we'll discuss the oncology consensus guideline on margins for breast conserving therapy and DCIS. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of 20 studies, then the end of roughly 8,000. Included studies had a minimum of 50 patients, DCIS treated local excision, uh, reported ipsilateral breast recurrence in relation to margin width, and a minimum follow-up of four years. You can see uh, in the table below that the odds ratio for development of uh, ipsilateral breast tumor was significantly higher with zero or one millimeter margins. For two and higher, it was essentially unchanged between all those, but significantly lower than uh, in women with one millimeter or less. Because of that, the recommended margins for DCIS are at least two millimeters. I will say, broadly speaking, the re-excision rate is higher for DCIS and that has to do with the nature of the disease, for example, and not being as easy to detect on mammography, as well as the fact it's typically not palpable. For adjuvant radiation therapy, we'll discuss the B17 trial. For this trial, 818 patients were randomized to breast conserving therapy or breast conserving therapy and radiation therapy. This randomization was stratified based on age, method of detection, and pathologic characteristics. 
All patients with negative margins were eligible. Negative is in quotations because at that time, inking was not routine, so roughly 13% had involved or unknown margins. Either way, it looked at the longitudinal recurrence of breast cancer, and it showed that with radiation therapy, you have a general decrease in invasive and non-invasive ipsilateral breast cancer. So next we'll discuss the European trial that looked at radiation, where basically we had uh, a little over a thousand women randomized to either lumpectomy and radiation or just lumpectomy, and again looked at ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. It again showed that a decreased rate of recurrence occurred with the addition of adjuvant radiation therapy. So because of this, the board answer is for breast conservant therapy, give radiation, uh, not with mastectomy. In practice, it's not always necessary. It can be guided by a multidisciplinary team and by using risk stratifying uh, tools like the Decision RT. This is an advanced tool that basically uses um, genetic and pathologic characteristics of the disease uh, to look at the benefit of radiation and you make a decision with the patient. Broadly speaking, though, radiation therapy decreases the risk of invasive breast cancer and DCIS. For endocrine therapy, the B24 trial looked at roughly 1,800 women, all of whom underwent lumpectomy and radiation therapy, and stratified them by age and method of detection. And it looked at the occurrence of invasive or non-invasive tumors in the ipsilateral or contralateral breast. You'll see in the graphs on the right, in the leftmost column, there is a demonstration of a decrease in ipsilateral and contralateral DCIS with tamoxifen therapy. Uh, the upper rightmost graph suggests a benefit in terms of ipsilateral breast cancer, However, subsequent meta-analyses uh, with the combination of additional trials showed a trend but no decrease in breast cancer in the ipsilateral breast. I will note that there is no benefit of tamoxifen generate, uh, demonstrated for all-cause mortality. Uh, the IBIS-2 trial looked at the benefit of aromatase inhibitors, so anastrozole. It took postmenopausal women with DCIS, atypical hyperplasia, and LCIS, and randomized them to either five years of anastrozole or tamoxifen. Its primary endpoint was breast cancer recurrence, and as a whole, it showed um, that both therapies were effective. For mastectomy, potential indications include multicentric disease, repeat positive margins after breast cancer, uh, breast conserving therapy re-excision, uh, a high risk of developing future breast cancer, so women with, for example, debracogene, an inability to achieve a desirable cosmetic outcome with breast conserving therapy or oncoplastic reduction, as well as patient preference uh, if they don't want to undergo ongoing screening or repeat biopsies in the future. The recurrence following mastectomy is quite low, about 1 to 2 percent. There's no evidence of mortality benefit compared to breast conserving therapy. Skin sparing and nipple sparing mastectomy appear to offer minimal difference in terms of recurrence. However, you of course have to consider the proximity of the nipple for an oncologic purpose, as well as cosmesis with nipple sparing. You do not need to perform radiation following, which can facilitate breast reconstruction. And you can consider endocrine therapy after a unilateral mastectomy for contralateral prophylaxis, although it is less efficacious with only one breast. For sentinel lymph node biopsy, basically the goal is that if invasive cancer is found on final pathology, any potential nodal disease is removed. It's most beneficial in cases with higher suspicion for invasive cancer. So multicentric, high-grade disease with extensive calcifications, palpable mass, younger age, etc. In breast conserving therapy, if you have a high index of suspicion for malignancy and someone's a high-risk surgical candidate, you could perform it at the time of the index procedure. Otherwise, you could just perform it uh, and take them back to the operating room. For mastectomy, it's routinely indicated because it causes permanent alterations in lymphatic drainage. So if invasive cancer is found, you wouldn't be able to perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy afterwards. For the boards, the safe rule is to perform sentinel lymph node biopsy with mastectomy and not to perform with breast conservant therapy. These are my references, and thank you for your time.